Hey, this is Mr. Spencer. We're talking about Chris McCandless. He also went by a fake name, Alexander Supertramp. We'll see him in Into the Wild. You're reading some of the passages this week, and I'm going to go over some of the key details. Why did Chris McCandless leave his family $24,000 in his savings fund, his college degree behind, and go up living in an abandoned bus in Alaska? What happened to Chris McCandless? Was this a suicide mission or some sort of inspiration where he wanted to find himself? Could you live in a place like this? All right, let's check out the notes here. I've got some slides on the PowerPoint. We'll check them out and we'll do a little summary. Okay, Chris wrote in a postcard to one of his friends back home in 1992, the last year he was alive, he said, I've decided I'm going to live this life for some time to come. The freedom and simple beauty is just too good to pass up. Sound good to you? The author of the book is John Krakauer. He was an avid mountain climber. He also wrote books about mountain climbing. He originally published an article about Chris McCandless in Outside Magazine, and he's very notable and published many other essays in the New York Times and other publications. Okay. Originally, the book spent two years on the bestseller list, and it was based on that Outside Magazine article that John Krakauer, the author, published about Chris. He was fascinated by this story, as I'm sure you are too. What's the connection? Well, Krakauer thought he thought him and Chris had some sort of connection between the way they looked at the world and their family lives. Krakauer, the author, said, I identify with him a lot. And it's a sad story. I went back to the bus for the third time last September, and I've become quite good friends with this family. We sort of have this weird bond. Okay, check out these links if you want to see more on the slides. There's pictures from Chris's undeveloped film in the camera found by his body. This is one of Wayne Westerberg. Wayne Westerberg was a man that Chris worked with for a few months. He gave Chris work just before he went up to Alaska. That's Chris holding the dog, and that's Wayne Westerberg. You'll read more about in chapter one of the reading. Here's a summary of chapter one, all right? You're reading the passages on the packet I gave you, but it says, outside Fairbanks, Alaska, we start with an electrician driving a semi-truck, Jim Galleon. He picks up the teenage hitchhiker, hitchhiker who introduces himself as Alex. Galleon, the electrician, is concerned that Alex, who claims to be 24 years old at this time, is underprepared for the several month stay he plans in Alaska's Denali National Park. Galleon asks Alex questions about his hunting license, since the young man is carrying a rifle, but Alex says he doesn't care about the government's rules. F the government, he says, and he insists that he'll be fine. The narrator, who we know to be the author, John Krakauer, he points out that this is typical of Alex. Alex is Chris McCann. McCandless. Alexander Supertramp is the fake name of Chris McCandless. So Galleon also notices that Alex's gun isn't necessarily powerful enough to kill large animals. Hmm, how's he going to hunt and eat food? It's a small 22 rifle. In exchange for the ride, Alex gives Galleon his few spare possessions, including less than a dollar in change. What's he going to do with that? And a plastic comb. Galleon insists that Alex take a pair of his work boots and some extra food his wife had packed for his lunch. He gives Chris this food. He drops Alex, or Chris, off at the edge of the park on the Stampede Trail. He's convinced that Alex will leave the park and come back to civilization as soon as he faces real hardship. Okay, Was Chris a teenager at the time, or was he actually 24 years old? Galleon, the electrician, driving the truck, he thinks this kid's a teenager. Okay. The next chapter I have is chapter 11. Okay, We're skipping other chapters. I'm just picking out the most relevant parts for you to read. Chapter 11, the narrator visits Walt, which is Chris's dad, Walt McCandless, at his home in Maryland. Walt, who is a jet propulsion engineer and sensor expert, has overseen a NASA satellite launch, and he works for NASA. He describes his frustrations and affection for Christopher McCandless. His son, Walt says, caused his parents great agony despite his kindness. Krakauer, the author, then relates Walt, Chris's father's past. After college, Walt went to work in jet propulsion after the launch of the Sputnik, the Russian Soviet satellite that pushed the United States to pursue space exploration. Walt married a young and a financially successful in his youth, but his relationship with his first wife and family fell apart. Later then, Walt meets Billy, who becomes Christopher's mother. Billy McCandless, Billy is a woman, worked as a receptionist at the science park where Walt McCandless was employed. She moved in with Walt McCandless, who already had three children when Billy was 22. 
Okay, you'll see this in chapter 11. The next part of chapter 11 shows, as Christopher spent his childhood in an atmosphere of thriftiness, saving money, and striving as his parents worked together to build satellite systems and consulting with other companies in this country, fights between his mom and dad led to closeness between Chris McCandless and his sister, Corrine. The tension was sometimes alleviated by camping trips that may have sparked Christopher's love for the outdoors. Christopher's paternal grandfather's love of camping and climbing may have also contributed. Corrine, his sister, and Chris were musical children, and they loved the family dog. Chris also ran cross country in high school and showed extreme determination to succeed in every task he undertook. Anecdotes from his school friends illustrate both his dislike of his parents and a contradictory unwillingness to complain. Other anecdotes from his parents demonstrate Christopher's intensity and strong-willed independence, including a run-in with a physics teacher he had in high school that led to him being failed for not wanting to follow what he thought were arbitrary and nonsensical rules. Christopher also secretly housed a homeless man on the family's property. That's bold. The McCandless family lived comfortably, for example, as their business succeeded. Billy and Walt, Chris's parents, eventually bought a sailboat and took their children on a cruise. The last part of chapter 11 that you can read details Chris's extraordinary success working as a manager for a construction firm before college. He saved his money. He did a great job. Subsequently, Chris McCandless purchases the Datsun, the vehicle he drives, to the American West. When Chris graduates from college, his parents offer him to buy him a new car with the money remaining from his college fund, but he lectures them about the folly and nonsense of materialism. He doesn't want a new car, and he donates the money to a charity called Oxfam without telling his parents. (laughs) They were pretty mad about that, but it was his money. Chapter 12, the last chapter we're reading this week, shows that there was a search for some rationale or reason behind Chris McCandless's trip into the wild that leads the author, John Krakauer, to provide a series of anecdotes. He says, for instance, after high school graduation, Chris McCandless takes an extended trip through the American West. Before he leaves, he gives his father a gift of an expensive telescope with the money he saved. Gave his dad a gift. While on this trip, Chris calls home infrequently. He won't call before falling out of touch entirely off the grid. He returns gaunt, skinny, and bearded just before he is to begin college at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So he goes away to school. His parents move McCandless into college the next week into the dorms, and he works for the student newspaper and makes high grades. He begins to unravel, however, becoming antisocial, and the narrator reveals the reason for McCandless's change during his trip he had discovered that his father maintained an affair and a relationship with his first wife and his other children before he had Chris and his sister, Corrine. His dad was heading up two households at once. Walt, his dad, had a son with his first wife after Chris was born and before Walt and Billy moved to the East Coast. Chris thought this was unacceptable. Krakauer, the author, then delves deeper into the secret deeper psychological motivations behind Chris's response to the secret that his dad kept. He posits that maybe Chris McCandless must have been unable to forgive his father, even though he was much more accepting of flaws than other people. Instead, two years after he learned his father's secret, Chris became irrational, publishing erratic public opinions in the student newspaper and living in an almost unfurnished apartment, no furniture, without a telephone his senior year of college. In 1990, after he graduated college, he gave all the money his parents had given him for law school, got in the yellow Datsun, and drove away. The narrator then relates Billy, his mom's worry for her son, and a moment in 1992, the year Chris died, when... McCandless had been missing for over two years from Atlanta, where he graduated college. His mom, Billy, wakes up in the middle of the night at the end of chapter 12, convinced that her son was calling her for help. What are some of the essential questions that Into the Wild asks us? Heroes, they often embody qualities of a culture. Is this an American hero? Examine McCandless as a hero. Do you think he is? What evidence is there that he's a hero to Americans like you or me? What qualities does he have that represent our own culture and what we value, what is meaningful to us? In what ways do the ideas of the transcendentalists like Henry David Thoreau or Ralph Waldo Emerson resonate resonate in modern America? Okay, can we transcend and go beyond? Is this a valuable cultural idea? And also, in life, what's most important to us? Is it our friends, our family, or is it the self? 
Our families, friends, or community essential to our happiness in any way? Can a person be completely content in solitude without the acceptance of society? Which of these is central to your happiness? What does it mean to be successful? If you earn $24,000, should you save it or give it away to charity like Chris did? All right. And finally, how do we construct our identities? What's the relationship between nature, like Henry David Thoreau going out in the woods at Walden Pond, and the relationship between that and the identity of us as Americans? What other ways do we form identities? Is it on social media? Is it with the relationships we form? What is your identity? What is your purpose? What was Chris McCandless's purpose? Can you compare yourself to him? What can you learn about your own person? and your own purpose from examining his. This is Mr. Spencer, signing off.